Okay, guys, uh, welcome to today's live stream. I'm so excited. I'm here with Dr. Kurakonda. I'm so excited to talk to him today about trauma. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me. Um, if you guys feel like his audio is too low or my audio is too low, please just let me know and I'll try to, you know, try to fix it during the stream. But otherwise, we are jumping into this conversation because of the conversation I had with the streamer Destiny, who's a friend of mine and a wonderful person who asked a very challenging question. And I feel this is way above my pay grade. And I wanted to reach out to somebody that I really admire and respect. I watch his work, Dr. Kirk's work on YouTube. And so if you guys want to check him out, I will link his channel for you guys. Um, the question that we're facing today is that question that Destiny and I really argued about for days, which was, um, do we think promiscuous or sexually liberated people versus oppressed or sexually uh, repressed or conservative people experience trauma from rape differently? So would a promiscuous person or sexually liberated person have an easier time of dealing with their trauma versus a sexually repressed or conservative person? And I wondered if you had any expert thoughts on that. Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack. Um, the first thing I'll ask you is how we define these two groups exactly, because you're mm. grouping prom promiscuous people, meaning people, I guess, who have s more sex with more people greater than average, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then, and you're also um, attributing the quality of someone who is uh, sexually liberated. Mm, uh, what mm -hmm. do you mean by sexually liberated? Well, that's the problem. The assumption might be that someone who is promiscuous could be sexually liberated. But of course, the nuance, I think, would challenge me to think that that's not always the case. Right? So that's the complicated nature of this question. I mean, even asking what is trauma, I think, would be a great question to ask. But that's what's so difficult about this conversation is there's this assumption that, oh, if you're comfortable with sex, you should be more comfortable with an assault, which is hard for my brain to process. Right. I think that's the central question that was in that was being asked. And the there are many there's been a lot of research over the past 50 years, a lot of research in the last 20, 30 years on factors that contribute to an increase in the negative outcomes after a rape or sexual assault and protective factors or factors that were in place before the event and after the event, behaviors, attitudes, social structure, legal structure, um, oppression, uh, you know, comorbidities or co-occurring issues. Like if you already come into it with depression or trauma, mm -hmm. Um, it can cause uh, greater trauma afterwards, potentially. And there's a lot of, I could go into the weeds on all those factors. But but what you're talking about is attitudinal factors, things that have to do with our ideas, our beliefs, our attitudes, our perspective, mm -hmm. pre-rape, pre-sexual mm -hmm. assault. And, and might that be a factor in protecting people from the... Uh, negative effects of which PTSD, dissociation, uh, avoiding relationships, uh, depression, anxiety, you know, there's yeah. a lot of negative effects downstream after an assault. And the research does show that attitudes can be a protective factor. Um, but there's so many other things that relate to, that are related to why someone would have PTSD after. Um, it's just one of the hundreds of factors that that could be involved. I would say that it's a dubious claim to say that if someone has had sex a lot, which was part of it, right? Promiscuity, yeah. which isn't necessarily related, as you said, to sex positivity, that these individuals would somehow be used to, I don't know, like, I don't know what sort of myth that I could speculate as to what yeah. myth that is standing on, but uh, there's no research supporting that people that have sex a lot would be protected from the negative effects downstream after being assaulted. Now, you you said it earlier, and I want to expand upon this because I absolutely don't want to take my friend out of context or anything, and we won't really be focusing on like what his thoughts are, but in general... Uh, is the environment afterwards, uh, uh, like if let's say you get assaulted and then you go into a very like supportive, wonderfully like, you know, just like you've got this, we'll take you to therapy. We love you. You're not different to us. We, you know, a very supportive environment. Could that 
change how the the night went because in my head I assume the trauma occurs during the event and then gets compounded on as the time goes on mm -hmm. so in my head I'm not sure how trauma could occur afterwards though some people have reported not feeling traumatized by an event only to feel traumatized after their friends and family told them they feel like they should be traumatized mm. so I'm trying to figure out that yeah uh, again, a lot to unpack. I could lecture for hours, but that would bore your listeners. Um, <laughs> I doubt it. They would be intrigued. <laughs> uh, but the, yeah, that, that's two, two or three different cat areas there. One is, is that uh, the last one I'll answer first, which is that the, uh, you know, stories you'll hear, or I don't know, you'll hear accounts of people having gone through a difficult event. Then afterwards, even years later, it could be 20 mm. years after the fact, right? They have some, uh, you know, sexual experience at camp when they're eight years old. That is, um, to them, at least their narrative is that it was uh, innocuous or weird mm -hmm. or whatever. And then they go to therapy or they talk to someone and they're just like, oh, my God, you were assaulted. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the individual goes down a road of believing they were assaulted and thus one could develop PTSD or some kind of trauma reactivity because of that. I would say that that's extremely rare more often mm. the uh, way I would, and it's impossible for us to know because it's not a concrete science that we can measure, right. but the consensus of that is that when someone goes through a difficult experience, as we all understand, I hope that uh, the negative effects can be hidden from us. We might be living the negative effects, but we don't attribute them to the trauma. We might be generally suppressing a lot of our emotions because of the trauma or mm -hmm. other kinds of reasons. And we don't connect the over drinking or the denial of our feelings or the running into relationships over and over again. We don't attribute that to the trauma until we're in therapy yeah. and then we're like, oh my God, I'm making these connections. I'd never thought of myself as being traumatized when I was eight, but now that I think about it, I think I was. Mm -hmm. so that's way more common than somewhat, but but it is, I think, possible. I think rare. Uh, and let me kind of explain it because it, mm. this could this could be a, a very difficult idea to put out there into the world for me. But that let's say you go through a difficult event, or let's say you go through. Uh, a weird event, just sort of some sort of notable sexual event of any kind, whether it's when you're a kid or, or older. And it, it, let's just say for the thought experiment, it doesn't actually traumatize you, meaning it doesn't scare you, it doesn't horrify you, it doesn't teach you negative lessons about the self or other people. And then later on, you're recalling the event with someone and they're like, oh my God, you were traumatized. That was um, an assault. Someone victimized you mm -hmm. and you're impressionable or you lack other information, education or something. And you start to rewrite the story in your head. You start to actually remember differently because memory yes. is, not, is not a fixed thing. We don't have a, a videotape in our mind. It's something that every time we remember something, we literally rewrite the story. And so we could potentially rewrite the story into, we could start inserting horror and terror and anxiety and victimization and exploitation and coercion into that story that as the memory starts to plague us, it actually mm -hmm. could cause negative effects downstream. I, I, PTSD, probably not, but things like believing that other people can't be trusted, believing that mm. you don't, you're not worthy of being treated well. Could that happen? Yeah. But again, I, I would uh, say that that's extremely rare. Let's say in the order of 1% of the cases that present that way where someone didn't think it was a trauma and then later on discovered it was a trauma. But you you had another question in there. There was a, a that was my short answer to the short question that I heard. But anyway, uh, there was another question that you asked that I'm forgetting. Do you remember the question? That you no, because now I have two new questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't Let's forget okay. about it. Let's move on. Okay, okay. Let's let's see if we can remember it later. I'm curious because you said it when when people come to me and during this debate we had a few people chime in. People were saying, "Oh, I had this molestation or this rape occur, and I don't feel traumatized from it." My brain goes, "Okay, very interesting." I'm not sure how that's helpful to people who've already been traumatized because you didn't get traumatized to get over it, but maybe that's insightful. And then the other thing you said earlier though is the question I asked them is. 
But if I looked at your life, do you think I could find some hot mess points? Like, do you think I could look at something and say, oh, this like this right here feels like this could come from trauma, but maybe it's not trauma to you. Maybe like I think about like serial cheaters or I think about people who can't stay in a committed relationship and they go, I was never traumatized. I'm like, hmm, seems like a weird thing to do then. Seems kind of cruel if you're not traumatized. Because if you're traumatized, then I'm lenient. I'm like, okay, we just got to get you therapy. But if you tell me you're not traumatized and you're a serial cheater, my brain goes, so you're mean? I don't understand, right? So I want to be open to the idea that people can have a relationship with their, I don't want to say trauma now because I'm projecting like I'm putting it on them, but maybe they don't feel like they were traumatized, but then would they ever know that if they didn't go to therapy? Mm -hmm. You think like therapy is kind of like, the key, well, you know, could you know without therapy if you were traumatized? Sure. Yeah. Plenty of people know they're traumatized without therapy. Absolutely. There's plenty of people go to therapy and never discover they were traumatized. Plenty of people. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends on the therapist. There's a lot of different styles of therapy. Depends on the length. Depends on the age of the client. A lot of times um, as we age, as mm. I've experienced clients, they tend to be more open to um, talking about these things, you know, um, I don't want to paint younger people as <laughs> lacking of self-awareness, but, uh, but it is sort of, sort of a, yeah. a, a trend, you know, like when I talk to a 16 year old, the chance that they're going to, um, have the discoveries that they will discover later at that age is not very high. Um, yeah. having said that there are plenty of 16 year olds who are very self-aware, obviously. Um, but yeah, um, that's, did I answer the question? I I'm think you sure. answered it. No, you answered it great. So I, I, if you wouldn't mind, and again, I'm not sure there's an objective answer for this, but like, what is trauma? Yeah. Well, we have two different main definitions. One is what we call maybe capital T is sometimes used trauma, mm. meaning that it is uh, things like anything that produces this is my definition, and you won't hear other clinicians and researchers necessarily use this word, okay. but it annoys me that they don't. Mm. Um, any experience that produces tremendous terror. Ooh. So if you're so if you're in a car accident, and so th let's take two different car accidents. One where, you know, um, yeah, it's a mild fender bender, and it you're not terrified for your life. You're just like ah. Oh. I have to get my car fixed now. You know, it's a disappointment. It's annoying. Right. It's like, oh, I can't get, I'm not going to be late. But there's no terror. There's no, whereas mm -hmm. you have another car accident where you're spinning out of control or a car is bearing down on you and you have time to sort of prepare for the fact yeah. that you're going to get hit. And your adrenaline just suddenly pumps through your body and you have this massive fight or flight, freeze, appease, faint response and you... You're jittery afterwards, and you're just okay. That's terror, right? Okay, so we I think we can all understand that emotional difference. And then when you're assaulted sexually, it can also have that. Uh, it's on that dimension. How much terror did the individual go through? One can be sexually assaulted and not go through a tremendous amount of terror. Mm. It can be difficult. It can be uh, harmful to the individual. It can be disappointing and painful, and could start to rewrite someone's. Uh, feelings about themselves, feelings about others, but they might not have the terror. And when you have the terror, that's what can be the breeding ground for PTSD and classic trauma, meaning mm. capital, capital T trauma. So the reason why I include this word terror is because you could be watching the news and uh, over the span of a day or something, mm. say there's a school shooting in your in your neighborhood and you have a kid that's at that school or even at a neighboring school. And you're just sitting there on the couch watching the television and you're in so much terror, but you weren't there. Right. Your, your child isn't actually in danger, mm. but your adrenaline is pumping so much that it's a tremendous amount of terror. And you can develop, in my experience and research shows, you could develop PTSD because of that. And a lot of that is kind of ignored by, it. we're still kind of growing our and broadening our understanding of, of trauma. Lower T trauma is what we tend to use in my field for things that were harmful to us in general that mm -hmm. don't necessarily involve terror. So you could, for example, I use the phrase relational traumas. So you could be 
a young child and neglected. Um, mm-hmm. your, your parents don't attune to you sufficiently, and you're left to your own devices. Maybe the parents are depressed or alcoholic, or they grew up in avoidant families and neglecting parents themselves. And so they parent their kids in a neglectful way, meaning that the kid might be crying or bored or uncomfortable or happy, and the parents just don't really pay attention. That doesn't have anything to do with terror. That's not anything similar to being in a car wreck or having someone assault you with a knife or threaten you and sexually sexually assault you and make you feel like you might be dead or I don't know. And so uh, completely different, but it's a harmful event that will affect the individual long term. That individual could, for for the rest of their life, be negatively affected by that lack of attunement, such that, for example, they might shut down their emotions, they might become pathologically independent, they might even become narcissistic, they might not acknowledge their needs or reach out for help ever, and they could literally die early because they don't go to the hospital or um, ask for help, um, which is shown in the research. So that is one of thousands of examples of lower T, lower case T trauma. That makes so much sense to my brain. And I wonder if that was the huge disconnect we were having in the conversation where in my head, when I said like capital R rape, I was thinking of saying no and then ignoring it. I was thinking about being forced down. I was thinking about, of course, I was thinking about my own personal experience, right? I was making it personal, which is not professional, but my brain couldn't comprehend some of the comparisons other people were using. And I wondered in your field, if when you guys are observing a client, if you do consider like I know the trauma can be the same, like someone could be molested and then someone could be physically penetrated, raped, and they could have the same amount of trauma. I don't want to like trauma um, hierarchy. I don't want to compare our traumas like that. But I want to say that the experiences are different, that I think the trauma flavor could be different, but not more extreme. Again, I'm not, I really don't want to, disclaimer, compare traumas like that. But I want to make it clear that I assume we're having different lived experiences, which is why when we have these conversations, there's so much, cog- like not cognitive dissonance, but like a miscommunication of what we're all talking about. So when someone says to me like, oh, I think a religious person would have this experience with rape over a promiscuous person or a sexually liberated person, my brain again stops at the individual and goes, well, it's going to be different for everyone. But that's not a good enough answer. So is there a general answer, a general consensus Mm -hmm. in this field? Yeah. Um, I sort of got to it earlier, which is that there are many factors that play into how traumatizing an event will be. Um, And perhaps these attitudes or belief systems prior or, you know, whether it's sex positivity or, uh, you know, promiscuity is separate from that, obviously, Um, you know, being religious, being conservative. Um, These things have been studied and they are uh, a factor potentially Mm -hmm. in not only one's attitudes as you're going through it, because one of the main factors is self appraisal afterwards and during so how do you see the self um, mm. do, you, do you blame the self and how do you assess the self so if you are raised in a religious environment that says that sex is disgusting and you're disgusting and there's this avoidance of sex positivity or sexual acknowledgement mm. and let's say that you go to a party and you dress a little flirty and you have a drink and you maybe talk to some people and you're thinking I wouldn't mind getting together with someone tonight and you believe that um, that's on the edge of sin or something Mm. and then you get assaulted. Well, for that individual, because of the pre-factors, there's a chance, there's a greater likelihood we could imagine that they would self-assess as they're to blame. They... Mm. They brought it on themselves. They dressed in a certain way. They shouldn't have drank. Um, they shouldn't have been there. Um, they should have listened to yeah. their parents or their minister or their, or their God or whatever. And they deserve to be punished. Um, they might not even want to tell anyone because of these reasons, right? Yeah. So might that... Uh, and so research shows that that absolutely can increase... What, oh, I know what question you asked that I think is relevant. Tell me. <laughs> You were asking, um, 
I, you know, you were saying that you thought that the trauma only happens. Well, I don't know if you were saying, but you were the main after, trauma. Yeah, it happens during the event, mm-hmm. like as, as you're being assaulted. Mm-hmm. And uh, research shows that yes, and there are compounding traumas. You use the word compounding um, afterwards. So mm-hmm. if, for example, you go through a negative experience, a difficult traumatic experience of an assault. The next day you wake up and you call your friends and you tell them. So one, you have to have the attitudes present such that you don't feel ashamed of yourself mm. um, to the extent that you don't tell someone about it, right? Um, or that you're to blame or you should hide it or whatever. And so um, then you tell your friends and your friends are there to listen. You go to the authorities um, and they walk you through a process that's very trauma-informed and mm-hmm. and there's a whole conversation there. Uh, you aren't blamed. You go to therapy. You talk about it. There's a lot of support. You still went through something difficult. It doesn't negate that. And mm-hmm. there still could be downstream negative effects from that event, obviously. But the recovery is enhanced and mm, sped up okay. and bolstered by attitudes and by behaviors and by support. Whereas you take someone in a different situation, given the opposite situation, yeah, maybe they go to the police and they walk them through a very common uh, procedure where they swab them, strip them naked, take pictures. No one's there to advocate for them. They're basically mm-hmm. re-traumatized physically and mm-hmm. sexually, one could argue, by the justice system. And that's an additional trauma. So they're left in a state of terror. So you know, people might be assaulted. They call the police. The police show they're still in a state of adrenaline, yeah. right? and then they're stripped naked, you know, thrown around, swabbed. No, they they're asking questions like, "When's this going to happen?" They're like, well, "I don't know," and you just get kind of get shuffled around. You're left in that trauma state potentially for weeks. Mm. You know, there, there's no relief to yeah. your nervous system. So obviously, um, independent of the actual event, you have all these other events that could absolutely, and research shows, can massively intensify the downstream effects of the trauma. Okay, well, that's wonderful news. I think that we now know there's something better we could do. So if I put you in charge of like society, what would be a great solution for the general public to make sure that when these situations happen, we allow recovery to happen in the speediest way? Oh. <laughs> What a wonderful question. <laughs> Wait, so I got to do whatever I want. Yes, to help society. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess practically, I mean, because if I could just snap my fingers, I would change everyone's mind. Mm. <laughs> but that wouldn't happen. But so if we actually were thinking practically, we would, in, it's always been a dream of mine to have schools either add an hour to school or just um, scale back on certain subjects that are, I guess, less important. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And you would include an hour a day throughout school from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade where you talk about a lot of things, including this. Um, uh, Attachment, relationships, self-esteem, body positivity, you know, LGBTQ rights, mm-hmm. uh, uh, critical thinking, mm-hmm, <laughs> how mm-hmm. culture affects us, the history of society, um, just all all that. Of course, <laughs> in today's world, that would just never happen. Um, but but at the very least, um, sort of the the big issues like the one we're talking about right here. So so that'd be one, and that that would um, hopefully give people attitudes heading into an event like this that would give them the resources to get through it and to recover afterwards in a more expeditious, um, non-complicated way. Would also potentially reduce the likelihood of people committing these acts to begin with because Mm. the individual research shows and experts will tell you that people who commit these acts are often treatable. They're not psychopathic sadists that are walking around just um, wanting to prey on other human beings. They're they're suffering in their own way. It doesn't mm. excuse it, obviously, but right. um, a lot of these individuals, after being caught and prosecuted and, and forced into treatment, 
they can recover. There are attitudes. Yeah, there are attitudes. You know, you have a lot of men, a lot of people, a lot of males who are walking around without any ability to get their attachment needs met, without any ability to process their emotions. And yeah. they uh, are, are just walking time bombs in, in a variety of different consequences, including this. Um, and we find that when we actually give them attachments and emotional intelligence and support and treatment and trauma recovery, they're extremely less likely to do this sort of thing mm. in the future. Um, it seems weird. It's like, well, why would you sexually assault someone? Because of, it's, there's not a clear logical connection, but we have found that to be true. There are individuals who are psychopathic sadists who aren't necessarily treatable and arguably not treatable, but there's even some argument about that. But anyway, so... Um, so yeah, so I would include an hour a day in school. I would also, uh, I would also try to help religious groups to, without changing their identity, shift their rhetoric around body and sexuality and gender mm. and sexual orientation. Um, for example, in Seattle, the vast majority of Christians are pro LGBTQ. There, yeah. there's no, there's no incompatibility there. So. It's not a matter of religion as at its core has to be negative, uh, you know, sex negative and, and pro, I mean, there's literally people who, who literally, with, no, after knowing all the details, will blame the victim after being assaulted. I yeah. mean, just like, they won't just imply that the victim is, is to blame, which is what a lot of people do, literally just because they'll be like, the Bible tells me that you're to blame. Yeah. And uh, so... There's nothing fundamental about these religions, in my view, that would necessitate these attitudes. So I guess if I was, was in charge, I would force them all to go through some kind of dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> even, even with themselves, like maybe just get a church in Seattle to go to, you know, Oklahoma or whatever. Yeah. And, and have just talk, you know, just be, hey, let's, you know, we're, we're all Christians here. Let's talk. So that'd be an, another thing I would do. I would change the the police system drastically. <sighs> there, are, there are movements around that to be more trauma informed. Um, the main thing that I would implement is that there would be an advocate, someone, a citizen, a non police person, who would either be paid or I mean, let's maybe paid. I guess would be the best solution, obviously, or, or volunteer if we couldn't come up with the funds. But immediately that advocate would be right, you know, sitting right yeah. next to the survivor and explaining the process and advocating for them. I was like, Hey, cool it. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. Cool I know that you're out to get the perp, but there's a greater good here yeah. of protecting the victim. And I know you're geared towards getting the perp, but the victim is decompensating right now. So take a break. And they would have that power to do that. Or, um, you know, so we're going to do a swab if you want to, because it will help with the DNA, but you don't have to, because you're the victim. You know, what do you want to do? I don't know. I want to give it, I need it. I need some time to think about it. Okay. Let's, let's give it some, you know, like there's a, there's a, a person there that can walk them through the process. And, um, so that would be another thing. There's probably a 50 other things, but that's, those are the things that pop into my head. I love all of them. I think those are all really lovely. Now that we've talked about a general solution for society, because we don't live in that world and we live in a very like if you're in the United States, we live in a very. I call them bubbles, but like we all have different backgrounds and belief systems and relationships with reality. So we don't live in a world where right now we have that cohesiveness to help victims. So what would you recommend individuals do? They find themselves alone. They're having this problem, whether or not they have a support system, they just feel alone in the process, what would you recommend they do as individuals? Mm. Um, well, two things. One is, is to do everything you can to stay safe because when we feel safe, we are, you know, we feel better and we're yeah. able to actually uh, do what it takes to take care of ourselves. So that's number one. You know, like some people are raped by people they live with. So, yeah. Um, you know, you have to value yourself and know yourself well enough 
and I guess have the privilege to be able to get to safety, how whatever that looks like. Um, the other is is to is to get that support um, from people that uh, are supportive and understanding. <sighs> But, you know, there's so many different pockets and like you say the bubbles um, and there's no guarantee. But the, the, there's so many different effects. There's so many different um, experiences. Uh, there's so many different ages. There's so many different situations. I mean, sometimes it's, it's literally your, your husband that does yeah. it or it's literally someone that jumps out at you at an alley or it's your it's a date rape situation or you don't remember a lot of it because mm. you were drugged or maybe even in uh, you know uh, consensually intoxicated i mean meaning you you decided to get yes. intoxicated um so there's just so many different things but i would say just prioritize that uh you went through something very difficult and unless you intentionally take actions to set up a a robust recovery plan, this could negatively affect you in psychological and behavioral and relational ways for the rest of your life. So I, just to prioritize it, I guess. Yeah. And, and so that might mean completely revamping your support structure, um, completely revamping your, your dating life or your mm. relationship life. Um, it might not, um, but uh, just prioritize it and and it takes a long time it's not something that you just potentially do you know in one day it could be something you cultivate over five years you know like yeah uh, it could be a wake-up call like i don't have a lot of sex positive people in my life right now i don't have a lot of self-esteem i don't have a lot of su actually supportive people in my life um so it highlights the fact that i don't have those things right now and um i'm gonna start to go down a road of building those things and cultivating those things. I love that. Thank you so much for that. Now, I know we're on a strict time schedule here. Do you have a few minutes to answer questions from the audience or do you have to go? Uh, sure. I have a little okay. bit of time. Let's, you just let me know and then we'll answer a couple questions. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> it says, um, this is from Aaron. Says, can you ask since most rape is are by guys who are really pushy for sex, getting the girl drunk enough to say yes or something similar? What protecting, um, uh, what protecting? It says majors can we take to stop that? I, I think we kind of went over that. Like, what steps can we take to protect ourselves? Like, do you actually think that there's a specific environment that encourages the possibility of assault to happen at a higher rate outside of extreme situations? You know. Like the college life is pretty typical. People get drunk and go to parties. Is there anything we can do ahead of time other than having a call buddy, maybe getting an Uber to pick us up, maybe having an accountability call we do, something like that? Is there anything that really helps shift our chances of not getting raped? Uh, yes. And plenty of people who do all the – take all the measures. Yeah. You know? Um, and yet they don't want to just stay home all the time. <laughs> you know, right. they want to, they want to socialize. Uh, but you know, they have the buddy, they yeah. know all the signs, they look for the signs, they watch their drink, they don't get too drunk. Um, you could be on a fifth date with someone that yeah. had all the signs of someone who, uh, wasn't likely to do something like this and they might do it. So, um, do everything you can, but also if it happens, don't blame yourself for not having done something to prevent it because yeah. sometimes it just comes out of nowhere. And I know that effing sucks to think about because it's like, you, how do you control for this if that's the case? Um, how do we protect ourselves from this? Um, it It's just, it's an unfortunate aspect of of our society. And like I said, if we had a more rational, healthy way of raising kids, particularly boys, uh, this would be drastically reduced. Um, but until then, yeah, there are a lot of things you can do, like um, just going slow, um, not getting alone with people, even if everything seems like, you know, you're at a party and some guys like, hey, let's go to my my car is just right over there, and mm. uh, you're you know, and you're like, well, my so 
a huge, one of the most common things that victims will say is, I just didn't want to make them upset. You totally. Know, I, I didn't want them to get upset. And when they reflect on that, they're just like, why was I? But we all are in that mindset. Mm -hmm. the, the strongest, most assertive, I consider myself a very assertive person. Under certain circumstances, it just happened to me last night. <laughs> I was out with my wife, and I won't go into details, but I, I, I wasn't assaulted. But, but someone was being uh, a, a jerk, and mm. afterwards I thought, why did I put up with that? You know, I, I, I had the right to be able to, you know, defend myself. But in the moment, I'm just like, but I don't want to bother him and I don't want to make a scene. You know, that, that impulse, I don't want to bother him. I don't want to make a scene yeah. is, is what rapists will use as a tool. And so the faster you can rid yourself of that and two, notice it. Like when you notice, when you're aware of it, like, you see yourself doing it and you're like, oh, I'm doing that. I'm doing that thing where I'm, I don't want to bother him and I don't want to create a scene. That's, that's a big red flag mm. that something bad could be happening. Maybe not, but, you know, maybe. Do you think that moving forward, let's say we, we implement all these wonderful Dr. Kirk ideas and society shifts and the world's a little bit better. Do you think it looks like a world where we're like, oh my God, guys, I was raped on Tuesday. Like, is that the future we're looking for, where people are so not traumatized by their assault? It's so a part of our expectation as humans that it's more chill? Like, is that our goal? Or is the goal to say we're going to be more compassionate and loving to people who have had something bad happen? No, I can't imagine um, with all the uh, healthy changes in our society and education system, political system, justice system, resulting in someone after being assaulted being chill about it afterwards. No, that that that's not compatible with human experience. You know that. It's okay. Just, yeah, it wouldn't. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that this is there's an idea floating around the internet that if we were just if we acted better around rape, maybe people wouldn't be as traumatized by it. But I'm like, I'm not right. sure what that means. <laughs> yeah, it's it's based on a on the myth that we were touching on earlier that if you just look at it a certain way, yes, then it's not trauma. You're you're just yes. Choosing to look at it negatively, which I just find to just, you know, I just want to take them and, you know, punch them in the face as hard as I can five times. And then, and then while they're on the ground bleeding, I'm just like, well, you're just looking at it negatively. It's not a big deal. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's literally what they're, what yeah. they're saying. And you're just like, are you that stupid? Or, you know, what kind of agenda? Or I don't know. It, it's, yeah. It's a, a I think, point. do you want me to be honest? I think they want to look tough. Like, they weren't victimized. But my brain is just like, yeah, dude, it sucks. Like, I hate it. Like, I personally hate having PTSD. But at the same time, I it logically makes sense like something bad happened. And so this happens now. But the idea that if I just thought about it different, I was like, maybe I need more therapy. <laughs> maybe that's what's wrong. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. And it plays into the self-shame of yeah. a lot of victims, right? Right. That I didn't recover fast enough. I'm still in pain. Why am I still suffering? Why can't I get over this? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, don't eat, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to calm down because it's <laughs> so upsetting. Yeah, I've heard that before. And uh, I think I just heard someone saying something like that the other day. And yeah, it's truly awful. It's a lot, you know, and I want there to be a compassionate understanding, compassion meaning to suffer with. I want there to be an awareness too that we might not be able to see people and therefore might not be able to help them. But I want people to know that if you have been assaulted and you feel like you're not traumatized for, from it, like I feel like that could be a real lived experience that I want to acknowledge. It's hard for me to process it, but it must exist amongst 8 billion people, right? Do you think so? Like, do you think people can experience it and truly come out just like good? Like the sa same way they yeah. felt yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. There are documents. I mean, it's hard to know because we're asking for subjective uh, experiences, but there are documented cases that people will go through what, from the out, from an outsider's point of view, you're just like, well, that's going to leave a mark psychologically. Yeah. And they will not have any symptoms. Um, uh, and they might attribute it to their resilience or. Mm -hmm. Their mm -hmm. attitude while it was happening, um, their, uh, I don't know, their connection with the divine or I don't know. There's various different ways that people will frame it. Um, but yeah, that, that variability does exist. The, 
the a-holes of the world will say mm. see that's evidence that if you just had a better attitude then right. everything would be fine that's not the conclusion there's just a wide variety of ex of experiences a wide variety of reactions to an event like that that's ultimately my concern and that's why i think i was a little upset and in my feelings about the way that the conversation was happening because again it was i did get a lot of comments which is like i understand humans are gonna human i did get a lot of people saying like see britney can't handle her trauma but look how this person handles their trauma and i'm like i i want to handle it the way they're handling it but i can't so i'm i'm asking for like an understanding perspective of I don't know what's wrong except what you know I did in therapy which is an under like I understand it logically and yet I can't introspect my way through my trauma so I assume it's not as simple as if I just thought about it hard enough yeah you know? no one no one chooses to have PTSD no one's just like you know what I just want PTSD so I can get sympathy like that's never happened <laughs> in the history of humankind no one wants the debilitating horrific nature of PTSD or depression or low self-esteem or self-hatred or avoidance of sexuality. No one wants that. No one says that's the better path. Mm. No one chooses that. It happens to people. So, you know. That, yeah. yeah, that right there does. Okay, that's okay. That's where we need to end this conversation so we can clarify. Does trauma happen to us or is it the way we perceive it that makes it exist in the first place? Uh, it's... Uh, Could so, be both? I don't want to quickly answer, but I'll just <laughs> a medium answer by saying that there are many factors that contribute to the effects of, of an event like that. And of the hundred different factors, one of them has to do with one's attitudes and perceptions. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's really reasonable. And I want, I always assume that like everyone's always 50% right. Like what wisdom do you have? What wisdom does this person have? So I think overall, I feel much more comfortable after having this conversation with you just to give us some sort of like place to jump off of. Um, and I wondered from your perspective, if you think how many more years moving forward, do you think until we come to a much better consensus or relationship with assault, rape, trauma, compassion in this regard, do you think we're 10 years off, 50 years off? Probably more to closer to 50. Oof. Um, uh, in my lifetime, I'm 52, and so I've seen shifts, but yeah, not much. Damn. Okay. Are you hopeful? Yeah. I mean, okay. there's a lot of good things now. Um, a lot of good things that are yeah. happening now. Uh, yeah. But in the interim, a lot of people are going to suffer unnecessarily because of our stupidity as a society and our yeah. refusal to acknowledge reality. I mean, it's yeah. science. It's, it's, it's scientific. It's measured. It's understood. It's not yeah. a debate. And uh, it's, you know, sometimes as a scientist, I feel like I'm screaming through this, um, this window that is soundproof. You know, me and other scientists are just like, you know, and yeah. we've been doing it literally for decades. And, Society just keeps walking by the window and we're not, we're, we don't exist to them. I'm sorry. One more question. Is that okay? And then I'll really yeah. let you go. I'm just sure. curious because you're, I know every therapist is different. Every person in this field is different. Do you think, because I got my therapy in Seattle. I was living in Seattle at the time. So I feel really, really grateful because they're very sex positive and very self-aware of all my alternative lifestyles. They knew not to contribute my trauma to my alternative lifestyles, which is really great. Do you think some people are getting less quality therapy if it's coming from a certain belief system versus like an objective science perspective not that science is perfect but do you think that you should strive if you're seeking out therapy to go for somebody who's more like a specific background i don't want to you know what i'm saying yeah uh one should and it's really hard to do this but one should try to be as knowledgeable as as possible about the landscape of therapy and the types of therapy and the types of therapists mm, mm -hmm. and know what they want out of therapy and find the right fit. And that's, that's hard to do because you don't really know someone until you meet them. Yeah. It's, like, it's kind of like dating in a weird way that you could read the, the website, you could maybe talk to them on the phone, but until you meet them and you have a few sessions with them, you don't really know if they're the right ones. But the other thing is, is most people don't really even know the landscape. They don't even know the Very options. Um, they don't know if 
a uh, therapy isn't working for them or not. So this is another perfect world uh, thing. I would fund nationally a program that you, and I was talking with someone else about this actually, that it would essentially be a social worker that would, their their only job would be to help people find the right therapist. This Oof. individual would, would know, mm. um, they would interview the individual, the client. Mm -hmm. And get a landscape of the of the you know sort of figure out say well I, actually I think and and this individual would know all the different kinds of therapy and would know all the research and know oh that would be so helpful have a list and then then would walk them through and would check in after three sessions are so is it feeling helpful to you, do you are they listening yeah. to you do you feel like this is actually enriching your life how do you feel afterwards um and then maybe say yeah maybe we should try someone else you know that to me would be helpful that would be but so helpful as it is you're kind of shooting in the dark and it's kind of luck of the draw but i oh, encourage I... people to jump ship if things aren't working out is a thing like try thank you for more. saying that yeah. i really appreciate it because i had to email over 70 therapists to find just two that would see me and one of them was just not a good fit and the second one i swear she like changed my life i was like holy like her she, she just knew my brain and knew how to humanize me it was great, but I had to personally take it upon myself to email all those people and say, "This is my issue. Can you help me?" And so you that knew, you knew to jump ship in that with that first therapist. Um, I was raised uh, very opinionated, so yeah, I asked her. I was like, "I'm feeling like you're not hearing me a little bit, and I'm just concerned that you are writing me off." And so she was like, "Oh, well, I just feel like meds would be better for you." I was like, "I am open to med meds. I'd prefer ten sessions before meds." And so she was like, "I feel like you need meds, or I'm not going to see you." And I was like, "Oh." That feels threatening. So I switched out. I got a new one. And the second one was like, I loved her. She was so a miracle worker. I don't know. She, she, she changed my life. Hey, so yeah, I did DBT you. with her. It was great. It was good the good greatest you. thing ever. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Now, Dr. Kirk, I really appreciate you being here. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, is there anything you want to tell my audience or where they can find you? I know you're on YouTube. Just Dr. Kirk Honda. And that's how they can find you, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Maybe okay. we'll talk again soon. I really hope so. Okay. Have a great day. Um, Bye. In my head, in me like falling bed. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine. Yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind. Cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking yeah i'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool Dun -dun.